Greetings, uh, my name is Corey and welcome to the Evil Treehouse. Um, I am a software engineer by trade and a wannabe game developer uh, by night. Uh, I've been tinkering with video game development since I was a junior hire. That was what, 1994, back when Quick Basic and C and Visual Basic 4.0 was hot and games could still fit on floppy disks and CD-ROM was kind of like the new thing and that was kind of about the time I kind of became disillusioned with continuing down that path professionally because it seemed like games were making that shift to where a guy in his basement can make a million dollars to 200 people in a, in a giant skyscraper needed were needed to make anything of value so I think that's when I changed paths and became more of a software engineer application side rather than video game side. It sounds like you made the right decision because there's a lot of, we'll call it, uh, not very positive press about being a software or a game developer these days. So this is probably the right decision to make. And for any of you guys out there too who maybe have looked at this stuff, looked at video game development in the past or just trying to get into it, I'm going to kind of put a different spin on it than what you've probably seen before. There's no shortage of awesome tutorials out there on YouTube, on Twitch, wherever. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a particular JavaScript library that I've become very fond of and kind of inject my own conceptual best practices into it, as well as bring in some pretty interesting stuff that I've put together. I've done about 60 prototype games thus far. Uh, so I've ex got a lot of conceptual ideas on how to do things and how things could best be done to help make games more interesting and more accessible. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to delve into that as time goes on. This is kind of my first establishing video, just seeing how my setup works, so I apologize if it's awful. <laughs> I apologize ex particularly because I have a mechanical keyboard, so it might be louder than you're probably used to. Hopefully I can find my old uh, uh, iMac Bluetooth keyboard to maybe be a little quieter in the future, but please bear with me. Um, so today we're just going to look at this library that I'm referring to, which is Pixie. Uh, there's a lot of great JavaScript game frameworks out there, um, but they always, and this is no fault to theirs, but they, they, they take control of the content pipeline from start to finish, so it makes you have to do very little of your own grunt work, but there's always something I wish it would done differently or I wish it wouldn't do so it would be faster or give me more control over this one little feature. So what Pixie is, is Pixie is just the graphics layer of your game or application, nothing else. Um, it has the concept of sprites, of vector graphics, so triangles, squares, shapes, whatever, and text rendering as well as cool awesome fancy features like emitters and filters and video car acceleration and all that cool stuff that all happens behind the scenes but it doesn't do things like sound it doesn't do things like control for you it doesn't do things like make the thing jump when i click the mouse button no like you have to write that all yourself which some people would consider that unnecessarily burdened but it does give you an incredible amount of control not only that but it helps you understand how things work better at a lower level and I think that's a really good skill to have for any developer so to get started here I'm just gonna do a quick let's do a quick pixie JS application in as few lines of code as possible and we'll move on to something more interesting in the next time so for those of you who used pixie or something like it before this might be a little bit extra review that you don't need but Feel free to follow along anyway because it makes me feel special. Um, before we do any development, you need uh, something to write your code in. I've used every programming ID on the planet. I've spent 500 plus dollars on IDEs over the, over the years for different licenses. And my favorite by far is the one that actually ended up being free. Uh, it's a product from Adobe called Brackets. Uh, it runs on Mac, Windows, maybe even Linux. So there's no reason for you not to try it. Uh, it's got a great extendable library of plugins, good code highlighting, supports most languages you'd ever use, all the ones I use in my, day, in my daily routine. So I use it for developing my code, um, my JavaScript games as well. I've gone ahead and set up a really basic boilerplate page. Um, we have a generic HTML index page that's going to hold everything. 
we brought in the Pixie library, which is downloadable for free on their site. And we've created our own JavaScript file that we're going to actually put most of our scripting into so we can keep the index page pretty light. The only thing we put on here is a basic configuration object which contains our, our resolution, desired resolution settings. We're going to do an old school 640 by 480 box and it's going to be slightly off white, almost white, just so that we can see it on the screen. And we've set up a, an event listener so when the page is ready, we'll be able to start doing whatever it is you want to do. So to get things started, we're going to hop over here to our module for our code. And we're going to write a function called setup, which will take our configuration in. Uh, it'll create a local copy of it just so that it has it forever in case we ever use it to do anything else. We wouldn't accidentally, uh, we wouldn't have to bring it back in later on. It's now local to this module, so we won't have to call for it again. Um, basically, the first thing you do for using Pixie is you create your renderer. And a renderer is basically a defined square area that's going to be all the graphic calls and all the assets and resources you set up are going to be drawn into this square. So we'll go ahead and make a variable for it so we have it in our module, local to our module. And we'll go ahead and do a new, we're going to force a WebGL render. Uh, you could also use, uh, if you wanted to support the old school canvas style stuff, you could do auto detect render. Uh, WebGL should run if you're running a modern PC with a modern video card and a modern browser. Uh, and it gives you all that cool um, hardware acceleration and things just look so much better. So I'm just going to go ahead and force it to use WebGL. Uh, obviously, whether you like to or not, that's up to you. This is just for a demonstration. Uh, the only argument you pass to it is you're going to set up how big you want it, height and width. So we'll use our configuration. And then just so that we can see it, since it's kind of blank right now, we're going to set its background color property to the one we have listed in our configuration file, in our configuration object. Now that we have a renderer, we're gonna, oops, we'll use our local window object here. We're gonna go ahead and put it to the web page. So this is kind of a the pick render.view is like the, the element and we're going to use the HTML call uh, append child to actually add it to the body. So that'll create a renderer. So that's a pretty decent basic setup. Uh, so now inside here underneath our call for ready, very important thing. Well, I'll demonstrate. Uh, we would call setup config, but that won't actually work until we can see setup from this from our global main namespace. So, something we have to do is link this setup with this setup. So we save that. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat here for web service purposes. Uh, Max ship with Python and that come with which I don't really use very much, but it has a library that makes serving a web page or a web application super simple when it's just basic HTML. You just call this one line and give it a, a number and it starts serving on that port. So now if we do this, try again. You see we have our pseudo render drawing it says that it's ready and pixel 307 is running in webgl mode so we're most of the way there okay um all that does is kind of set up a an, uh, an element ready to receive rendering information uh since we don't have anything showing yet that's probably the next thing we should do uh at the concept of the renderer, you have a, a kind of a global hierarchy of objects. 
And the first one on top is called the root stage. I guess that's a flash term for those of you who used flash. So we're going to set up our stage, which is where all of our graphic resources will ultimately get attached to. The stage is nothing more than a standard pixie container. So now that we have our container ready, we'll set up our render loop. So for those of you who know kind of the general idea of how uh, rendering works, um, draw frame using all the graphics that you know of, you wait some number of milliseconds and you do it again. So that creates the concept of animation and Pixie does no different. Um, when you want to render something, you just call the render function on the render and pass it the root stage so everything inside of that's going to get drawn and then after that's done we'll go ahead and we'll tell our browser to do it again so it's just going to run in this constant loop so even though we don't have anything on the stage right now it's actually going to be running at approximately 60 times a second so it'll give you that 60 frames per second feel um, I think we might be able to at least see it to some degree. No, I guess not. Might have to get a little further still. Oh, that's probably why our configuration it did come over, right? Looks right. We set our background color right. Oh, we never actually called render. Cute. Um, yeah, all we did was define it. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to send it back uh, via setup. So back here when setup is done, we're actually going to get our render function back here. And we'll just go ahead and call it. And that'll start the loop up. There we go. So now we have a 640 by 40 box of off-white, gray, white, and there's nothing on it but it is drawing at 60 frames per second it's hard to prove it to you but uh, it is doing that so not very exciting thus far so we'll go ahead and I guess close our foundation video out with adding our very first interesting element um, for simplicity's sake we'll use a text or a caption uh, which is essentially just a font uh, with text drawn a certain fill at a certain place. So inside our setup, after we've built our stage, we're actually going to call a build function, which will be localized here, which will actually add the stuff to the stage prior to getting the rendering started. So we'll go ahead and use our pixie, new pixie text object. And we'll do a basic uh, setup here. Um, any, any object gets attached to a stage or a container it automatically gets drawn to the top left corner or zero zero as the coordinate system would show so we're gonna go ahead and tell it to move somewhere else so we're gonna take the configuration width six approximately 640 we're gonna subtract the render width of the caption which may be like 120 divide that by two so that way it should be centered in the middle of the box and we'll go ahead and move it down 100 pixels from the top. Now that we have a caption built, it won't appear until you actually add it to the stage. Uh, all entities have to be added and removed individually. So now if we save that, we call build, we run render, we refresh, we hope it works. <laughs> There you go. We have a a uh, exciting green text thing in the center of the screen. Okay, I can't leave it at that. We gotta do something to at least prove that I'm not just drawing text in the middle of the screen. So what we're gonna do is inside our render loop, we're actually gonna call a function called recolor. 
So what I imagine doing is every 60 times a second, we're going to change the color of the text. So it's going to be this psychedelic light show, man, but it'll be cool. Um, we'll need to be able to access the caption object again after we built it. So instead of making it local only to build, we're going to make it local to this main module. And that will allow us to call recolor and change it internally. So before we draw the screen, we're going to get a new fill color. And this is kind of a, a weird way to do it, but what we're basically going to do is we're going to look for an integer that is any random color. So what we're doing here is we're basically saying between the color zero, which is black, and the color some big hexadecimal number, which is all white, multiply that by a random number and then round it up to the nearest integer and that'll give us the, a random color somewhere between black and white, which includes all the reds, all the greens, and all the blues. So I don't know what it's going to look like, but we'll find out. Uh, so once we have the fill color defined, we're going to change the caption style. Actually, you might have to do this differently. So what we're going to do is first we're going to get the style out of because the style is just like an object that keeps all the stuff like we have, we have font and we have fill. So we're basically changing this value. And to make it change on the fly, I've found that I've occasionally had to do this. So we, cut, we basically alias out the style, we change the fill color internally, and then we set it back. Oops, wrong. To our copy, which triggers all the necessary things that need to happen so that uh, the color is rendered properly in the next frame. And well, just for fun, we'll have it move down one pixel each frame, which means eventually it's just going to fly right off the screen and we'll continue on forever, but that's okay. This is a different example. So we refresh here. Actually, I guess we'll give it more room to move. We'll have it start at the top of the screen. Give it a refresh. Whoa, psychedelic light show. So it's changing color every 60 seconds, moving one frame at a time, until it eventually disappears into nowhere. Well, that's the idea of Pixie. So we got a pretty up and running graphic concept in, I don't know, 35 lines of code? That's not too bad. I don't think uh, most frameworks could have done a whole lot better just to get this up and running. Um, obviously this isn't the most exciting stuff, but mo almost everything else, including sprites and emitters and textures and stuff, all pretty much follows the same basic design pattern. You create a new function, or you create a new object, set a few settings, add it to a stage, and uh, it just will start working. Um, to really get into the concept of game design, uh, we'll definitely be looking at doing libraries to like manage your entities, uh, manage your game control scheme, um, drawing user interface, um, I don't know, artificial intelligence, uh, drawing tile maps to do old Zelda style adventure games, uh, scrolling the screen, or simulating the scroll concept for games that need scrolling, um, scaling this your your uh, imp, your I'm trying to say your production so that it gives it nice pixel art feel. You can even have it auto size when you change the size of your screen so that it looks all awesome and pixely when you make it all large on the screen. So we're gonna do a lot more cool things with this. I hope uh, if people totally don't like these videos, then maybe I won't consider it. But hopefully, at least someone finds them interesting. Uh, I have about 28 video ideas in mind. Uh, some of them go all the way up to, and don't hold me to this, but multiplayer game design, so internet based, playing games over the internet. Uh, since I do a lot of web app development, I have a pretty solid engine concept worked out that I would like to share with you. So uh, I guess let me know how this went. Again, I apologize for the keyboard. Uh, I hopefully have a quieter one the next time. But until then, Maybe this weekend we'll have another one up, but all of you, thanks for sticking with me this long, and uh, hopefully I'll see you around in the future. Take it easy, everybody.